How does it feel to be back in a gym? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of crazy. So much of my childhood was in this very place. Like, you would drop me off at 4 p.m. and pick me up at 9 p.m. and have I, dinner in the car, exactly. and then I would come home, That's, do all my homework. I and, know, and that was just the norm. We just did it. And yeah. You seem to enjoy it, right? <laughs> <laughs> I did enjoy it, yes, yes, yes. Yep. I will always remember my freshman Ivy Championships. It was like the biggest meet of my collegiate career thus far. Doing college gymnastics was a dream of mine. I remember saluting the judge, getting ready for my bar routine, and just letting muscle memory take over. It was probably one of the best routines I'd done all season. I had to pinch myself that here I am, I'm a D1 athlete at an Ivy League school, I'm pre-med, I thought everything was going well. I was just really feeling quite unstoppable. <laughs> yeah! Within a week, I hit the lowest point I've ever been at in my life. Today, the World Health Organization said the greatest disease threat is not Ebola or AIDS, but bacteria that resist antibiotics. One day, the efficacy of these antibiotics simply will be gone. More than 1.2 million people die every year of untreatable infections across the globe. Wonder drugs aren't as wonderful as they used to be. Drugs that we've relied on don't work anymore. We are sitting on a time bomb. 1932, self so 1944, 45, Without them, all hell breaks loose. Therapy We will enter a crisis. All of modern medicine sits on the shoulders of antibiotics. This is one of the most significant existential threats to humanity. I think I remember you having a favorite beam. I did. I your definitely did have friend. a favorite beam. This is your old friend. The week following Ivy Championships, I remember having the gradual onset of pain in my left hamstring. I didn't think that much of it. As a gymnast, you're always working through aches and pains. It's just part of the sport. But over the course of the week, nothing seemed to be making it better. I remember meeting my mom and the look in her eye, I could tell that she knew that something was uh, terribly wrong. And she took me right to the emergency room. I just remember lying on that table in a hospital gown, feeling so out of touch with my body. I had these shaking, uncontrollable chills. took me into emergency surgery and discovered that I had a 15 centimeter abscess um, deep to my hamstring and associated muscle infection. They started me on broad spectrum antibiotics and then, you know, within 48 hours, they realized these antibiotics aren't working the way that we thought that they would. In that moment, I was fighting for my life. I remember the trauma surgery team talking to my dad, and my dad coming back in the room with tears in his eyes. And I had not seen my dad cry, um, probably ever. And I just turned to my dad and I asked him, you know, dad, are they gonna have to amputate my leg? And he couldn't answer me. Um, they discovered that I had a methicillin resistant Staph aureus infection, or MRSA. In order to gain control of the infection, um, the doctors put me on some of the strongest antibiotics to treat the infection that was raging in my bloodstream. And recovering from that infection, it didn't end when the surgeries were over. I still had a few more weeks left in the hospital. Uh, I was discharged with pick line antibiotics and um, drains in my leg that were just hanging out the backside of my leg and that my poor mom had to take care of uh, when we went home. I 
weren't the doctors saying it was like a perfect storm, that they couldn't understand it either. I was scared when they were closing up my leg. It was like, how do you know the infection is gone? And, you know, unfortunately, I remember the doctors telling me, you just got really unlucky. And to just think that I got unlucky, that wasn't, you know, a, enough assurance to me that something like this wouldn't happen again. I really didn't have any knowledge or awareness of antimicrobial resistance at that point. I did not think that it was something that I would ever have to worry about. I think quite often about how would my outcome have been different if we didn't have that second or that third antibiotic available to treat my infection. We knew her tenacity and her attitude and her perseverance. It was, nobody was gonna stop her and, and that's just who she is. And she amazes me every single day. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Tough girl, tough girl. A miracle out of mold. This evil looking fungus would still be regarded as a pest, were it not for a brilliant doctor, Professor Alexander Fleming of St Mary's Hospital, London, who discovered that it produces the drug known as penicillin, the marvelous new cure for various types of blood poison. the course of human history, more than 100 million years, the time that we have had the upper hand on pathogenic bacteria has been a very, very small slice, about 100 years. Life was very different before antibiotics. Fleming experiment changed everything. During a lifetime devoted to medicine, he received great honors, including a knighthood and the Nobel Prize. But the only reward he ever sought was the knowledge that he had given good service to his fellow men. The millions throughout the world whose lives have been saved by his great discovery, the benefit he has conferred upon humanity is incalculable. I've been studying bacteria since I was a graduate student. And I mean, they're just incredible creatures. They are built for survival. Through evolutionary pressure, mutation, selection, right? The stuff that Darwin taught us about. That bacterium finds a way to resist the antibiotic. And the antibiotic is suddenly out of luck. The use of antibiotics creates resistant organisms to antibiotics. And that really is the big problem. Antibiotic resistance is inexorably rising. It rises because of overuse and poor use of antibiotics. Thank you. At the beginning, it felt quite lonely because a lot of people said, why are you doing this? I mean, is it important? And anyway, aren't the more important things you should do? Ten years ago, I was chief medical officer for England. But what I saw was that superbugs, bugs that don't respond to the treatments, the antibiotics we give them, were rising. Meanwhile, the big pharmaceutical companies had to close down their research in general. So we have an antibiotic pipeline that's empty, no new drugs coming to treat patients, and patients getting sick and dying. I thought once we laid the case out, everyone would say, oh, we wish we'd known earlier. Let's just get on with it. It's been a perpetual battle. I am concerned we could go to a post-antibiotic era, and that means modern medicine would go out of the window. From the time I was a medical student to today, most certainly the number of days that I experience drug-resistant infections is increasing fairly rapidly. 
virtually every time we're on service and seeing patients in the hospital, we will find infections with organisms, bacteria, that are very resistant to antibiotics. And that can make treatment very challenging. Hello, how are you doing? I think most physicians around the world would have this experience in common. Deep breath in, out. There was a report that estimated by 2050, the number of deaths due to antibiotic resistance will exceed the number of yearly deaths due to cancer. The number of new drugs that are coming out has not kept pace with this acceleration of drug resistance. It's frustrating. You wish you had more tools. Go get the Come here. I was born with cystic fibrosis. It mainly affects the lungs. My life expectancy was always just a little bit past how old I was. Give him something you can throw. Come on, come on. It was April 21. She had an ear infection. It was painful. I just couldn't hear anything. So I went and I got some um, medicine for it. It felt better, I guess, a little bit after, and then it came back again. We went to our ENT. They started me on IV antibiotics, and it just never went away. The second she would come off the antibiotics, it would come back. She was on them for about 18 straight months. My body was so tired and just of all these, all these medications. At UT Southwestern, they did um, susceptibility tests on the um, bacteria. This was a, a bug that was resistant to virtually everything. Now what do you do? And it was the bacterium that we're seeing a lot of more and more called Pseudomonas. And her organism that she had in this ear infection was highly drug resistant to multiple antibiotics and the infectious diseases team treated her with a variety of traditional antibiotics without much success in clearing her ear infection. It's hard on patients and families. It's hard on physicians trying to make someone feel better and treat them successfully. So if you don't have the tools to do that, that is a setup for big problems. Her doctors are doing 100% all they have. But if you listen to what they're saying, we are out of options. We've gone through lung transplants and the number of surgeries and infections and things that she's gone through. And you're sitting there thinking, an ear infection? You know, I've, I've had 10 of them myself. This is so silly. I get scared, you know, I think I have children. I have my soulmate and I don't want to be apart from her. I would hate to lose her. My children need her hours seem imminent, like you don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. So this is some lion's mane uh, mycelium. No way. From Mike, yeah. <laughs> However, he, he took a chunk out of it uh, for, I think, seeding a new culture. But yeah. The most recent class of antibiotics discovered that's used to treat patients. That was more than 30 years ago. And economic factors are to blame for sure for that lack of innovation. Many of the trainees that work in an academic research lab like mine, you know, would, would ultimately find a place doing drug discovery at a pharmaceutical company. But the vast majority of pharma companies have ended their research in this area. That leaves now a swath of mostly small biotech companies to fight this fight. And that's pretty limiting. You, you might have to be out of your mind to training this area right now. I mean, you, you know, if you're truly being strategic about what's best for your career, it's probably to go work in a cancer lab, not in a lab that's trying to find new antibiotics. There's a lot of talk about how 
antibiotics are this old problem, it's unsolvable, there's not the right incentives, pharma's leaving the space. For anything that's really difficult and where people keep telling you it's not possible, there's so many other areas of, of biotech and life sciences that could be hugely profitable. Why take this on? For me, that's the reason to take it on. Drug development is an extraordinarily complex process. Typically, it takes about 13 years, a billion and a half dollars with risks all along the way. In antibiotics, the risk reward is really challenging. So we feel that there needs to be a real sea change in how antibiotics are discovered and developed. What do you think of the next compound that we're working on? We're using the power of AI technology to accelerate and add precision and scale um, in a way that we've never seen before. I need to do like a back of the envelope calculation. I know where you want to go with yeah. this. Hey, Denise, can I write on this? Actually? All right. So hang on. I know where you're going with this, and I like it. I really, really like it. OK. Um, Hang on, I'm, I'm gonna like round, do some round numbers real quick. Is that okay? When I first met John, I thought this could be someone that, you know, you see skateboarding uh, the Brooklyn Bridge in New York, and I was shocked that he was so passionate about antibiotics. He has a sense of, I don't care how other people have done it, I'm gonna do it in a new way. Everybody likes some science. Like I grew up playing hockey. And you can't win games unless you get shots on goal, right? So AI gives us many more shots on goal. Do we have a P200 multi-channel? Oh, here. The number of potential drug-like molecules that could theoretically exist is roughly 10 to the 60, depending on who you talk to. 10 with 60 zeros behind it. It's a number that we can't comprehend. Let me try to put it in a little bit of perspective for you. The approximate number of atoms in our solar system, our whole solar system, is 10 to the power of 57. It's unfathomable. An AI model can run predictions for new drugs orders of magnitude faster than we can do those experiments in the laboratory. For example, in our lab, we might be able to test 20,000 chemicals a day for antibiotic properties, let's say. An artificial intelligence algorithm can perform 20 million predictions a day. So the fact that we can now, with more confidence, apply these AI algorithms to help us search this vast chemical space for new medicines, it just gives us a better opportunity of stumbling into the regions of chemical space that might have those drugs that we really, really need. It's genuinely paradigm changing. Hi, John. So I wanted to just see how things are going. Everybody is working harder than they probably should. But right now, we've identified a handful of compounds. When we discover something in an academic laboratory, that is step one of a thousand step process in order to turn something into something that even resembles a clinical medicine. So Aquila bears the responsibility of doing everything she can to convert what we discovered in the academic laboratory into a medicine. That gap is enormous. That's called the valley of death. We feel that that valley is so deep in antibiotics, it's virtually a chasm. In our case, we're bridging it with philanthropic investment. People are there, the technology is there, and I think you're starting to see an understanding of how urgent this need is. If you're up to 85, you're called very old, but above 85, then you're very, very old, so I'm 86. As far as the way I think, I, I'm 18 years old. This is the number of emails today alone, hundred and and 63, this is crazy. There's a big vaccine Congress in Washington, D.C. here. I, I don't like going to those anyway. 
I'm uh, Carl Merrill. I'm a uh, physician, but um, I never really practiced medicine. I, I've spent my whole career doing basic research. And um, I've spent a good part of it working on bacterial viruses. I'm used to people not accepting anything I say because if it hasn't been done before, people don't want to believe it. I started working on phage in 1966 and almost immediately realized it could be used for treating diseases. For me, growing up with my father, who's a phage researcher, I'd heard about phage before I could talk. Phage are the most prolific bacteria killers on Earth. They are naturally occurring viruses that host on bacteria. So they're all over the environment. They are nature's way of keeping balance with the bacteria on Earth. When I was growing up, my father used to talk about phage and why don't people use these things? I knew that there were, there were situations where patients had died with infections that couldn't be treated with antibiotics. And my dad would talk about that. I was very frustrated and upset because I'm a human being and I'm a animal physician. And one of the things I don't like to see is people suffer and I don't like to see them die. You know, it was, there was nothing I could do. I was aware of my father's frustration and I started thinking through, well, what would be necessary to, to move this concept forward? Greg had started a couple of companies, so he brought a knowledge for how to raise funds, and he had contacts, and he knew how to get the thing going. Adaptive Phage Therapeutics is a startup biotech. We are designing processes which will allow us to provide personalized phage therapy on a global scale. Come right in through our airlock here. We are targeting the 10 most serious antibiotic resistant bacteria and we're constantly building it out. So it's a, it's a never ending collection. If we don't have a phage that will kill that bacteria, we'll find a phage through a phage hunting program. We'll take samples from the animals, soil, really anywhere you find bacteria, you're going to find these phage. This is good. I am excited because this poop literally can save someone's life. Thank you, Giraffe, for pooping for us. We have collaborators collecting environmental materials from all over the world, and we will expose our target bacteria to those environmental samples to look for the potential of phage being present in those environmental samples. I don't know anybody else who would do what he's doing. He knows in depth what this is going to take. Um, and. Um, you know, it, 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 it's tough, and it's, I know that it's not easy to work with me. So he's learned how to get around that. So are, are you glad that you, that you got me roped into uh, to helping out and trying to make this move forward? Glad isn't the right word. I think ecstatic is a better word. And deeply in debt, because without your participation, I, I couldn't, I couldn't, I wouldn't do it. Even though I, I'd know that all these people are gonna die. Hopefully, we'll be able to save them, but we'll do it together. Thank you. Jeremy's eyes lit up because it was, you know, exciting. To have them go on to this experimental, non-approved concept, and I lit up because of the possibility of another day. And so the bacteriophage killed the big offender, the one that, that there's no drugs that it, it, it was dominant. Now that it was gone, a smaller or less strong bacteria rose up, but it was easily treated with antibiotics. 
thank the Lord, they were able to match her bacteria to a virus. And here we are. It's crazy. I don't know what would have happened if I didn't have it and I still had that bug in my body. Carrie has been through so much and her doctors are so thoughtful, so competent, and we just have a great degree of admiration. It's been a while since I've seen you. How are you? How are you? Okay, I miss you so much. I haven't seen you in so long. Nice to see you both. So good to see you. You too. Having drug-resistant bacteria is a challenge because as people with cystic fibrosis get sicker and sicker and we have to give more and more antibiotics, it certainly becomes challenging because we see the response be less and less. We face these multi-drug-resistant organisms every day. It's sad because we know that that's a possibility that we will not have a tool to help our patients. I can only imagine how you felt when I called you proposing the idea of phage therapy because we had run out of antibiotics to treat the infection that you had. I was just very grateful that you had something else that you thought of to try to save me um, and make me better. Thank you. Let's put the other ones up. I look at it as one more day, extra time, and I know that I'm supposed to be here <laughs> Every day does count, and there's more things that I need to do. AMR's a big problem in hospitals across the world. But as you go south into the developing world and low-income countries, this becomes much much worse. About a fifth of the deaths every year are in sub-Saharan Africa. This is more important as a cause of death than HIV. Good morning. Hello. Are you okay? Ghana is one of the hot spots in terms of antimicrobial resistance in sub-Saharan Africa. This is a huge burden for us as a country. use of antibiotics is common in the community and in Ghana. A lot of people lack the adequate knowledge and they have no idea how to prevent and control infection. So education is key. We started antimicrobial stewardship in Lekma in 2019. Effective antibiotic stewardship ensures that there's creation of awareness among our staff, the community, it ensures that there's training and policies put in place for prevention and control of infection. We have mild, we have moderate, we have severe, and that will help you actually make a decision on what to do. Because it's not in all cases of asphyxia that you actually want to put the child on antibiotics. So we all need to be stewards of the antimicrobials we have. We develop educational materials, both for the clinical staff and then for the public. They need to understand that antimicrobial resistance is real. Your temperature is high. How did you know your temperature is high? You touched your body and it was hot. OK. As a facility, we have adopted a delayed prescription. Bring out your tongue. So, uh, so for those that we think have viral infection, we would delay their prescription until we have seen that result. OK. Most of the time, it's usually viruses that cause the infection. So I want to see that result before I decide whether we have to treat with an antibiotic or not. In Ghana, the first point of call for a sick person is the pharmacy. Somebody can walk into a community pharmacy and have complaints of cough, 
cold, whatever it is, and be given an antibiotic without a prescription it results in abuse of these drugs. To get a positive outcome, we need to involve the community pharmacists and train them on antimicrobial stewardship. For the past two years or more now, we have actually had a much lower percentage antibiotic use in the hospital than that of the original target that we have been given. It's not only practiced in the hospital, at community level, the patients who fall ill, they know what to do to prevent the diseases like infection prevention and control. I would like to see in the nearest future where every single clinician, every pharmacist or prescriber, even the patient is fully aware of antimicrobial resistance. When we get new antibiotics, I, when I was chief medical officer, wanted to put them in a safe and lock them up because the more they're used, the more resistance will rise to them. So we need to keep them, steward them for the patients who really need them. And that limits the um, profit that any company can make. In one sense, the drug companies can't win, but I believe they owe it to humanity to do something. They're gonna have to amputate my leg. An ear infection? I've had 10 of them myself. What we have to find is a way to pay for the drugs however much you need and use, but keep them like fire extinguishers somewhere safe where they're only used when nothing else will work. The way we have tried in Britain and we're now putting into routine practice is what's called a subscription mechanism, very like video on demand. You pay a subscription every month, and you might watch one, you might watch none, or you might watch a lot. We piloted with two really useful antibiotics, and the NHS sent contracts with those companies that they would supply as much or as little as we wanted to use. So they know how much money they're going to get, and we can husband and look after the drugs so they save lives, but we're not driving resistance. So 10 years on from starting to advocate for action, I think we've made quite a lot of progress, but I'm still disappointed. I do believe we need a tent with lots of people in it. Where are they? If we can invest in people, scientists, students, physicians, economists, social scientists, all of the key players involved in inventive solutions to AMR, this is a solvable problem. We do have a lot of people who are really zealous, who are passionate. This is not a single company problem or a single government problem. I mean, it really is going to take a worldwide effort to deal with it. What world are we going to give our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, if we've lost all the antibiotics and they go back to dying of a scratch they got in the garden when playing? I think my path has been anything but linear up until this point, and honestly, the curves have made it all that much more rewarding. So currently, I am a third year at Duke University School of Medicine. But I think my experience taught me things that a textbook never could. When I think about why I do what I do now, which is research for antimicrobial development and approval, and thinking about antimicrobial resistance at large, my mind goes back to a 19-year-old girl lying in a hospital bed whose mom, sorry, <laughs> whose mom sat beside me every single day. Um, and I know that like when I'm a doctor, I want that patient to have options to have other antibiotics to treat their infection because I really think that, you know, 
patients should ha be able to have the outcomes like I had, which was a good outcome. When I'm a doctor, I don't want to have to look a 19-year-old girl's parents in the eyes and tell them that we don't have any options for them. Thank you.